thank you all for coming out. I'm, I'm super excited. This is the first time I'm giving this talk. Um, so I, it's like, I feel like I'm a comic sort of trying out new material. Um, but uh, I, I want to try and explain this book. Um, and it, it, in part, uh, the, the easy thing to do is just to give it, give it away. Here we are. Here are the seven cheap things. Uh, nature, work, money, care, food, energy, and lives. Thanks very much. Um, <laughs> I mean, so, so the idea here is, is what, we want to, what we want to do is show that capitalism couldn't exist without these things. Uh, they are in crisis, and that's a good thing. Um, and it, it's hard to, to overstate quite how much capitalism has made us who we are uh, and makes it so hard for us to imagine, I mean, to, to, to sort of think out of this moment and these times that for most of us, it's easier for us to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism, right? I mean, that's the, the, the bumper sticker. Um, but if that's the case, um, let, let, me, let me just sort of give you an exercise in, um, in, in just appreciating the depths with which uh, capitalism has seized us. Um, and I, I just want to just a quick show of hands. Um, when jobs are scarce, men should have more right to a job than women. When jobs are scarce, Men should have more rights to a job than women. Can you just raise your hand if, uh, if, if you agree with this statement? <laughs> All right. Um, now, th th this is, a, this is a, a question that was administered to uh, citizens in a range of countries. Uh, the, the country that, that uh, scored the lowest in agreeing with this, uh, this statement was Sweden. 2% of the, the population uh, agree with this statement. Um, the United States... Uh, a, uh, a magnificent 5.5% um, uh, agree with them, and we all know who they are. Um, uh, the, uh, in, in India, it's 52%, and in Egypt, it's 99.6%. So, um, the interesting question is, what is it uh, that helps explain the, the, the extent to which people agree with this statement? Um, is it the presence or absence of oil? No, I mean, think about it for a second. I mean, you know, when one has ideas about where, uh, you know, where chauvinism is rife, and one correlates that to, well, actually, there are some petro states where one could imagine these kinds of uh, opinions running riot. Maybe that's a that's a reason. Uh, maybe it's religion. Uh, perhaps it's uh, the uh, presence or absence of underwear advertisements. Um, you know, there are some representations in the media, but perhaps it's, um, in in fact, just mainstream media in general. Um, or is it uh, the, uh, is it plows? Um, of course the answer is plows. Uh, and no, for real, uh, I, I don't know why you're tittering. Um, this, uh, no, this, this is, the, in the Quarterly Journal of Economics um, in 2013, uh, a range of, uh, of variables were sort of were run against the the propensity to agree with that the statement uh, 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 the, 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 these ideas about sexism and gender roles, um, and controlling for uh, income and a, a range of other things. Uh, of, of these, the, the most important factor was the presence or absence of plows. Does it, a society that traditionally uses plowing is more likely to be sexist than one than a society that hasn't traditionally used plows? Why? What, what in, what in the good, good green earth can explain how plows cause sexism? <laughs> but but, but this, 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 is a for real, this is a serious question. Um, and that's why we wrote this book, is to, 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 to give you a sense of uh, how it is that we might explain this through, uh, through uh, uh, very rich ideas of capitalism. Um, but if you, want, if you want the sort of the, the, the Cliff Notes uh, explanation, this is the picture you should be looking at. This is Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, painted by Thomas Gainsborough in 1750. Um, I don't know if everyone can see that. But, uh, this is a, a sort of traditional uh, vision of the English countryside. And for a long time, it was just understood as being, oh, you know, isn't the English countryside lovely? Um, but increasingly, uh, scholars have noticed that this is, this is a, a picture that's, uh, firstly, it's about real stuff. This is a real place. Um, and uh, Mr. Andrews, the patriarch, uh, was, uh, owned it all. Um, he, he's, his father, um, he, 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 he gets this land by marrying into uh, Francis Andrews, his wife's family. Uh, Robert Andrews himself 
uh, has a father who is a uh, silversmith who owns, uh, you know, who's connected uh, through his trade to the, the extraction of silver from Peru, the death of indigenous people there, the slaughter, uh, and the, the, the trade that passes through Europe and down uh, it through into China. And all of that funds the acquisition of all this land. Uh, and it, it allows the patriarch, uh, Robert Andrews, to be uh, in control of nature. I mean, you know, he, he can own stuff, he can own his dog, he, he can own life as well as property, as well as land. Um, and of course, uh, he can, in order for this land to work for him, he needed to boot off the English peasantry. He needed to clear the commons uh, and enclose this land here so that uh, it might be used for more profitable things than peasants um, and uh, the, than the commons would allow. You, you remember that the, the commons is this space in which uh, peasants were traditionally uh, uh, able to survive. Uh, on that land, you could glean, you could uh, forage, you could, uh, uh, and in particular, uh, women could be in charge of dairying. Um, but when you enclose that land, uh, then it becomes impossible for uh, women to run their cattle. Uh, and dairying becomes the kind of occupation that is not economically sustainable. When you kill the commons, you kill women's access to the resources they need in order to be able to work in English peasant society. Uh, and when you introduce uh, new kinds of cropping system uh, like this, which, is, which requires a plow, and which uh, you, you see the, the, these nice neat rows here, they, they may have been planted using a seed drill. Uh, again, another kind of industrial agricultural technology. The seed drill invented in 1704 by Jethro Tull. Um, thank you. I, d <laughs> not enough people understand the importance of Jethro Tull. Um, so so you, once, once you create the, the kind of economy that's about industrial monoculture, uh, rather than a peasant economy in which uh, for example, that, that, there's, that there is the potential for women to be able to work and to be able to earn money. Um, then all of a sudden you have new gender roles being created. You have the instantiation of the household. You have women confined to the home. You have uh, very strict gender roles ascribed to women and men. Uh, and then, you know, in the same way, you have uh, his property. I mean, the, 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 the laws of English coverture uh, meant that in every way that matters, this is a painting about ownership. Uh, and uh, if, I mean, just, just look at the way that he comports himself. Look, he's, he's standing there like this. Uh, I mean, he's slouching in hunting gear, which is, in 1750, the most casual you can be painted without being naked, essentially. Um, so he's, he's wearing a kind of Kiss the Chef t-shirt, uh, whereas she is uh, as corseted and bound and defined as the land around her. Um, and in fact, you even see here, the, um, uh, you know, the, this area of the canvas here is, is unfinished. Uh, and it, it was, it's, it's been suggested that actually on this canvas uh, there was going to be a, a, either a bird that he would have shot uh, or some needlework or a junior Andrews, a, a baby uh, that uh, Robert Andrews would also have owned. But this is a picture of today. This is a picture of industrial agriculture. This is what it is, right? I mean, the, the ideas of patriarchy, of do dominion over nature, of industrial monoculture, um, these are all things that are alive and well right now. And again, that's the idea that we're, we're, we're trying to get at in this book, um, is to say that the, the processes of capitalism that begin essentially with Columbus. Um, and you know, we follow Fernand Braudel uh, in, in sort of dating the, the origins of modern capitalism to uh, the beginnings of the long 15th century. Um, but with you know, the, those trends are alive and well. And the reason we, we're going back into history to sort of mine these, these ideas, these pictures, the, you know, the, the, these visions, is to make our present seem strange. I mean, the, the goal here is to make it so weird for us to live the way we live right now that we're, prote we're ready to take a relationship to it that we haven't had before. Um, another way of showing this, uh, and a way of going through these cheap things more systematically, um, is to think about... Uh, what some people have called the Anthropocene. I mean, are people familiar with the idea of the Anthropocene? You raise your hand if you've heard of what the Anthropocene is. Okay, if you haven't, essentially the idea is that if there is some civilization after humans have died out and they, they, and they, uh, they, they patiently excavate the geological record, they will know that we existed because there will have, there'll be traces in the land, uh, traces uh, that we have laid down in the fossil record of things like um, uh, atmospheric nuclear tests. Um, th that's a signature that humans were here. Uh, another signature is uh, the 
plastics in the ocean. Um, by 2050, there will be more plastic in the sea than fish. Um, uh, and also, uh, 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 another sign um, is, is one that's more subtle. Um, it's the presence of trillions of dead chickens. Um, this is the world's most popular bird. Uh, right now, there are 12 uh, billion of them alive. Every year, there are about 50 billion uh, that are born uh, and killed and eaten. Um, and so we have this, this particular bird, Gallus gallus domesticus, uh, has been transformed into the planet's most popular bird. How and why? Well, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you, you can see that right, right here in the United States, chicken consumption um, in uh, pounds per person per year was fairly stable until after the Second World War when you have a boom in industrial agriculture um, and production and the pushing of, of uh, chicken by, uh, by, you know, by the industry. I suppose one would call them big bird. Um, but uh, they, they, they marketed and encouraged the, the, the consumption of chicken for meat. I mean, usually it was, it was chicken for eggs, uh, but the transformation to chicken for meat happens after the Second World War. And it happens, uh, and it continues to be a global problem now. Uh, now we are at around, you know, what is that, 30, uh, 30 and a bit pounds per person per year for every human on the earth. Um, and that, that's, that's a number that's going up. Um, so the, the question is, all right, well, uh, what's, what's behind that? Well, one, of course, is the idea that, that we can, uh, you know, that, that, that chickens exist for us to be able to take and use. So we, the, uh, this is the, the, the red jungle fowl. Um, this is the sort of ancestral chicken. Uh, and we have taken it, and through breeding programs, in part funded by taxes uh, from, you know, the, the, that we pay to the U.S. government, who then uh, engage in, in uh, the, the, the kinds of experiments that produce uh, chicken like this, which are so big that, because the breast is the most profitable part, uh, the breasts are so large that, that this particular animal can't lift itself up. Um, th that relationship to nature is, is something that's external, that can be mined and taken, so the red jungle fowl can be taken from the jungles of uh, Southeast Asia and East Asia, and, uh, and its genetic material plundered for free uh, to be able to produce this. And at the same time, if we, if we aren't particularly interested in certain species of chicken, we can discard them, and we can dis discard their species. So 50% of uh, the, the, the species of chicken that existed at the beginning of last century are now gone, um, because they haven't suited our purpose at a, at a particular time, and we found that the habitats in which they find themselves are much more lucrative, turned into other things. So a relationship to, to nature that's disposable, well, I mean, that, that, that's something, of course, that, that uh, is uh, writ large in the various kind of catas... You, you don't have to look at any of these other than, basically, these are a series of hockey sticks of how bad things are. Um, I, you know, we, we could substitute a, just a graph of bad things that starts pretty low and then goes right up, and things get really bad. But, but it's interesting that, that this is the, the, the sort of language of bad things, and this is the language of the Anthropocene. Uh, that we can take nature and just sort of chew it up and, and throw it away, and it has long-term consequences. Um, the next thing, of course, you know, the, the, these chickens don't turn themselves into nuggets all by themselves. Uh, they, they, um, we haven't quite got there yet, and so the, you, know, you need labor. Uh, but in the United States, uh, chickens, uh, I mean, the, 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 the lines are through, through which chickens are produced involves just horrific exposure to uh, injury. Um, so, you know, occupational illnesses five times higher, carpal tunnel seven times higher, repetitive strain ten times higher in the chicken industry than uh, any other, you know, but, than the average occupation in the United States. Um, and this is uh, at a time where chickens are going past at about 120 to 140 birds per minute. Um, but this is, this is a number that's going higher. Um, so the, the chicken industry right now is applying for a waiver from the uh, fr from Sunny Purdue, uh, no relation apparently to the Purdue chicken, but uh, th th the idea is that the chicken industry, again, big bird, is trying to push uh, faster line speeds uh, to make it uh, so that you can have 200 birds per minute. 200, 200 beats per minute is incredibly fast, uh, and already this is mangling people's bodies. 
uh, in, in the United States. And of course, you know, th these workers are treated as disposable. Um, only three cents that we ever spend, that, that we spend, uh, for every dollar we spend on fast food chicken, only three cents of that goes to workers. Uh, but in some cases, very little of that goes to workers. I mean, you know, we, we have a, a, a food system that, that uses prison, and, uh, prison labor. These workers would be paid uh, 25 cents an hour. Um, but you know, the, the exploitation of workers is still, uh, I mean, for, no, no matter what you've been hearing about the labor movement, people are resisting. Um, it, around the world, you're seeing strikes. You're even seeing strikes, um, well, actually, well, let me get to that in a second, but, but the, uh, just a, a corollary to this. Uh, if you go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you'll notice that uh, of the, the, the worst paying jobs in America, it starts at $9.27 and goes down to $10.58 an hour. Um, the yellow highlighted ones are the ones that are um, uh, in the food system. So you know, the food system requires and demands cheap work. Um, and uh, you know, the, people are, are being chewed up and spat out by that. But people are striking back. Um, so for example, even in China, the, the, the number of strikes and the number of labor disputes and the number of worker actions is going up. Um, and I think, again, you know, if we're thinking about cheap and about moments of crisis, just as with nature, we're seeing that hockey stick moment. Here, we're seeing uh, the number of strikes and the number of labor disputes going up. Um, and uh, I think that that's part of the reason why we're seeing uh, a, a concomitant rise uh, in things like slavery. Um, it, it's, it, you know, we, we often think, oh, yeah, you know, slavery, it was, it was a very bad thing that happened, and thank goodness it, has, it doesn't happen anymore. Um, but we now have 40 million, this is, this is data from the International Labor Organization released two weeks ago, uh, and globally, uh, 25 million people are in forced labor, 15 million people are in forced marriages. Uh, and this is a, a way to, to, ex, you know, to, I mean, insofar as strikes make labor costly, um, people are, uh, yeah, certain employers are, are ready to, to skirt that. Um, and if you look at the kinds of work that people are involved in, agriculture, 11% uh, of the 40 million slaves, uh, so over 4 million people are involved in agriculture to make food cheap. Um, so it's interesting that 24, I mean, the, the largest slice of this, 24.3% of, uh, of people involved in, in modern day slavery are involved in domestic work, in care work. Um, and it's important to recognize that, I think, because the corollary of cheap work and of workers whose bodies get spat out of the line uh, is that you need cheap care. Because who's gonna look after uh, people with these kinds of injuries? These are the injuries in the, that are routinely caused by the chicken, in, uh, by, by working on, on, in the chicken line. Finger cuts, obviously, repetitive strain, tendonitis, um, and you know, uh, concussions from being hit in the head by these chickens going fast. I mean, th th there's a range of things that, that, uh, th th that are a consequence of this. Who's, yeah, how is it that these bodies are taken care of when often there's, there's no health care? There has to be a community, an infrastructure um, of people who are ready to pick up the pieces for this care, for, for, the, for the paid work. So cheap care is an integral part of how society functions. Um, and if you were to, to sort of put a number to it, uh, if the world's gross, uh, the gross world product in, in 1995 was $33 trillion, 16 trillion of that was unpaid work, uh, of which 11 trillion was women's unpaid work. Uh, it's not a coincidence that under patriarchy, it is uh, to women to, to whom the, this care work disproportionately falls. Not always, but uh, often. Now, and you know, and we're seeing you know, rebellions against that uh, in in this country. We're, you know, we're see, you know, I think that there are trends moving away from that, but it's still um, a source of, of, of profound worry. But having cheap work and cheap care also requires cheap food. Um, so you know, the, the idea of the dollar burger. Uh, the dollar burger fits into a system uh, that is global. Um, if, if you look at the, the, the prices of industrial and processed food over the past um, 20 years, um, you'll see that in general the, the, the movement is that for fresh fruits and vegetables things are getting more expensive, but for pro processed food a little less expensive. Uh, interestingly, chicken uh, in Mexico, so this is around the world, you can look China, Korea, Brazil, the United Kingdom. Um, for Mexican chicken, that price drop, that, that extreme uh, decline in, uh, in, in prices is because of NAFTA. Um, and in fact, with the, uh, the, the, the prospect of NAFTA now being uh, torn up, uh, the, the one casualty will be the, the reintroduction of 75% tariffs for U.S. chicken being exported to Mexico. Uh, because, yeah, basically the reason that chicken is cheap in Mexico is because the U.S. is dumping out cheap chicken in, in Mexico. Um, but 
in general, the, the story here is that in order to make it possible for people to work for incredibly little amounts of money and for their care to happen uh, for free, you need food to be cheap. And the trouble with that is that while you, you see some movement for, for, with, with that in terms of, you know, I mean, certainly not fresh fruits and vegetables, but industrial food, is the price rise, the real price rises have been, been kept manageable. Um, in general, that's being imperiled by climate change. Uh, and you're seeing uh, major sort of commodity crop yields uh, falling and projected to fall because of climate change. Um, but still, you need you know, the, the other sort of compromise with you know, the, the, the reason that, that low wages are possible is because you have cheap energy. Um, and you know, certainly to be able to make these chickens cluck, uh, you need cheap energy to be able to warm these, uh, the, these massive hen houses. Uh, and of course, that means an, an increase in, in uh, carbon emissions from fossil fuels. Uh, and the trouble with these fossil fuels is that they are becoming more expensive. Um, we're seeing, uh, the, if you look at the, the capital expenditure per barrel, the price of oil is going up. Uh, and particularly here, what we've been finding out recently is that the only reason that this capital expenditure is, is uh, as relatively low as it is, is because the, the US government has been throwing money at the oil industry. Uh, most of the oil production over the past few years wouldn't have been possible without cheap money. Without loans, concessional loans, from the US government uh, to the oil industry. Um, but th this cheap money, uh, it actually, it, it also works for, um, you know, for, for franchises. You, 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 you'll know, I think, that, that every franchise uh, that, that opens anywhere uh, in the United States is eligible for a small business administration loan. You can, you can apply to the small business administration and get a loan up to $2 million, uh, government subsidized loan, because you're opening a small business that's going to serve the community. Um, this one magically has a supersized my pay outside. Uh, supersize my pay protest uh, outside, but uh, in general, cheap money is, I mean, is a sort of prerequisite for, uh, for the survival of, uh, the, you know, of not, not just of the food system, uh, but of industrial capitalism. Um, you know, when we think about the, the, the decline in the rate of profit uh, since the 1880s, um, and you see that uh, with, with a small spike um, with the, uh, the, the, the recession in the, in the early 80s, basically interest rates are now at zero. There's no way they can go any lower. And this augurs, again, the end of or a, a crisis in the, the, the ability of, to be able to cheapen money any further. Um, and the, perhaps the most difficult thing here is that there's a, a crisis uh, around cheap lives. Because um, look at who's working in the chicken industry. It's predominantly people of color. Um, I was talking to some union representatives yesterday, and I was saying, well, you know, to, to what extent does it, is it possible that, that uh, because of people's documentation status uh, or because of uh, you know, the, the, just the, the sort of prevalence of ideas of white supremacy on the line, that this might be affecting workers in one way or another? Uh, and this old white guy from the Teamster said it would be impossible to understate this. It would be impossible to understate the extent that racism on the line makes it possible for certain kinds of workers to be disposable. Uh, and not just racism, but also sexism, uh, because the women who are working on the line are, uh, are, are, are treated incredibly badly. Um, but the, that, that idea of cheap lives is, is, a, is a hard one to, to wrap your head around, um, because it, it sort of, it's premised on the idea that uh, the, the world is, exists to be able to be, uh, to, to be exploited by one group of people over another. Um, now, of course, you know, what, what one could talk about you know, the, the, the rather sorry history of, of, the, the, that uh, white supremacy has in this country. Um, but it's important to actually connect the idea of white supremacy to, back to the food system and to cheapness. Uh, I mean, for example, that there was a time uh, where the federal government were, were paid, for example, uh, $500 for, for this particular scalp uh, for Taoya Taduta, um, who was known as Little Crow. And, uh, the, the clearing of land to make it the kind of land that you could have a monoculture on, you can have nice and neat rows, uh, required the extermination of certain kinds of ways of, of interacting with nature uh, and the, the, the clearing of uh, you know, the bison that roamed that plain. It, it involved uh, the, the, the destruction of uh, the people who were considered outside society. I mean, I think that that's one of the, the sort of big insights that, that we, we want to sort of push in this idea of cheap nature, is that modern capitalism 
emerges at the same time as these two terms, nature and society. The opposite of nature is society, under, uh, basically un under modern capitalism. Uh, it's, a, it's a change that, happens, that starts happening around the 1700s. Uh, and so for people to be outside society licenses their exploitation in ways that we, we couldn't condone were they to be, part of, to be considered part of society. That's why indigenous people get to be called naturales, for example, when the Spanish uh, encounter them in, in the New World. Uh, and that's why uh, the idea of the sort of the, the natural, uh, the, 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 certainly the noble savage, but the idea of uh, a, 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 a connection to nature that is not civilized um, is one that, that licenses a certain kind of extermination. Um, and you'll see here that these bison skulls um, were, uh, again, I mean, but what, what's, what's interesting here is that these bison skulls were then ground down and used as fertilizer on the Great Plains uh, as they were turned towards industrial uh, monoculture. Uh, corn and wheat. Now, I mean, th th that idea of race and su supremacy is, is something that you get to see. I mean, you, in, in this, uh, this graph here, you'll, you'll see in green um, Europe, uh, and then the rest of the, you know, the, the majority, this, 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 this lovely pink here, is uh, places that Europe has colonized. Um, and uh, I think it, it's, it's worth just taking a moment to take a relationship to that. Uh, and to understand, first of all, that we are on settled land here. This used to be Muckleshoot territory, and now it's, uh, you know, the, 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 that, that history has all but been erased. Um, but we live in a settler colony here. Um, and that's something that's hard to take a relationship to, but something we need to take a relationship to. Uh, and if you want to see the sort of the, the culmination of that, of the idea of the dominion over nature, uh, of uh, the... the the, the, the culmination of a certain kind of, of supremacy, a certain kind of license to, to, to understand and push capitalism to its limits with its seven cheaps. Um, here's a picture uh, that, that you, that, that, that's, uh, I mean, I, I think this is fascinating. Um, I mean, it, it does sort of pull together uh, many of the, the concerns we have. Uh, I mean, you know, here's man in plane, um, in his own plane, eating chicken with a knife and fork, which is always seems bizarre. Uh, thing to do with Kentucky Fried, but there we are. Um, uh, but, but you know, I mean, the, the, the idea that, that, that you know that, that this this lifestyle that this you know that, that, that this thing is at all possible um, is, uh, I think, the, the sort of zenith of the idea of seven cheap things. Um, so what do we do about that? Uh, again, you know, if, if we're interested in taking a relationship to things, what what is it that, that we can we can see ourselves doing? Um, one could imagine, for example, asking. Uh, the private sector to step up um, and to, you know, to, to, to help us out here. The trouble is, um, I, I mean, I, I, was, I was sent to this, uh, this graph. Um, this, is, this is from the, the bomb-throwing anarchists at KPMG. Let me, let me explain what this is. So uh, in 2012, um, KPMG uh, put together a report called Expect the Unexpected, Building Business Value in a Changing World. Which, of course, I mean, it's a title that tells you nothing. Um, but w what they were interested in is, all right, let's take some very conservative assumptions and ask how bad, uh, how big a mess is every industry in the world causing? How, at, at, how cheaply do they value the environment? How much are they trashing the world around them? And so uh, they, they compared two numbers. They, they compared the... Earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So, so basically, the, the big revenue number that, that every industry has. Uh, and you see that in this, this delightful orange here. Uh, and then they, they did a sort of cost-benefit analysis. Uh, well, they did, they, they did a, 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 total cost, uh, a total environmental cost analysis of the damage caused by this industry. And they came up with a fairly rosy scenario. I mean, look, look here's oil and gas, uh, an industry that had 670 billion US dollars in revenue, but only 23% of that, uh, you know, of, of that revenue was what the, um, the, the environmental damage that this industry did. You can tell that's a fairly conservative assumption. Um, and, uh, and so the idea is, well, look, we can imagine these industries existing happily ever after uh, as long as they just internalize all their costs uh, and everything, you know, everything's going to be OK. I mean, there'll still be some money for them to be profitable. Um, that's true for everywhere except the food industry. Interestingly, even 
on KPMG's magically made up numbers. I mean, not magically made up, but I mean, it's, it's hard to, 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 to believe that only 23% of the, uh, the, 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 the oil and gas production uh, footprint is as small as that. But with the food production, uh, they found that 22, sorry, that, that, that with an industry that produces $89 billion of revenue, its footprint is 224% of revenue. So the short answer here is that there is no way for industrial food manufacture to do better. So when you see Walmart or when you see uh, Amazon Whole Foods or when you see uh, you, you know, your food producer of choice um, offering their sustainability platform, you can laugh at them. Um, and, and you can point out, I mean, you can certainly point them to these numbers, uh, but you can, you know, I mean, and you can say that, th that this is obviously a PR exercise. And I was sent to this graph by the head of sustainability at Nestle, um, who said these numbers are right, and that they've done the, they've done the math, and theirs approximates these. Uh, and that should worry everyone, right? I mean, when these firms themselves, by the logic under which they operate, end up generating these sorts of numbers. Uh, I think that's, that's a worry, because uh, too often we've been lulled into, into believing, well, look, if, if, only we, you know, if, if only we buy organic and you know, we, we shop local and we buy the whatever it is, the low-carbon Nestle product, well, they, they sell them here, but in, in, in Britain the, 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 there's, there's, there was a trial of sort of red light, amber light and green light for, for carbon footprints. Um, but as long as we shop smart, everything's going to be fine, that's bollocks. Um, and it's, 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 it's wrong because uh, of the way that capitalism is structured. Uh, there's only so much that, that uh, the, the right kind of consumer choice gets you. Um, and so that's why this whole idea of the Anthropocene seems to me a bit dodgy. Right? I mean, we know that we are in the middle of the, the sixth extinction. These are two different, uh, again, uh, this is more of the bad things kind of a graph where um, uh, we notice that you know, from the 1500s, they've got this sort of trend line that this, this, should, this is the background rate of extinction, but we're noticing that things are getting, uh, being rendered extinct at a far higher rate. Um, but we really oughtn't to call it the Anthropocene, because it's not the Anthropocene that's generating this kind of behavior. Anthropocene relies on just the idea that uh, it's humans being humans that's causing this, in the same way that, you know, uh, boys will be boys, or uh, the, the, you know, chicken will be chicken. But there's nothing, there's nothing about humans that that results in this kind of an outcome. It's much, it's much more sensible to think of this as the capitalocene, right? It's much more sensible to understand that uh, the the sixth extinction and the precipice at which we find ourselves is not because of something innate to human beings at all, because we have plenty of data about human societies right now. That are doing a tremendous, uh, that are able to flourish because they are involved in commoning and conservation that is part of the way that they have always existed. Uh, this is not to romanticize indigenous communities, but to observe that some of them are really very good at not exterminating the planet. <laughs> um, and that's, I mean, uh, that, that's a fairly modest claim, but it's one that's important to remember because that it, it's, it helps violate the idea that uh, you know, this is just an inevitable outcome of being human. It's not about being human at all. It's about being capitalist subjects in a moment of capitalism. So if that's the case, what do we do about that? How, again, how do we take a relationship to it? Um, well, this is the bit where I, I feel like, again, what, what Jason and I were doing when, when we were going for this book is to point out that in every one of these, uh, you know, of these cheap things, there is resistance that looks much bigger than just a sort of single issue focus. So, you know, obviously, the, the, when one thinks of lives, uh, perhaps one thinks immediately of, of, of the movement for black lives. But actually, uh, the, the the idea of natives live, native lives matter um, is a global idea, uh, and one that various indigenous peoples forums have been pushing for a very long time with with considerable success. Uh, and that would be important because uh, to understand and, and recognize what it is that indigenous peoples, uh, societies, and civilizations have to offer us is, is surely a first step in moving forward to a different kind of relationship. Um, not only to, to thinking about sort of energy revolutions, but also to thinking about nature. I mean, I, the, I'm excited to be here at this particular time because we are, we, I've just missed uh, one of the big salmon festivals um, up north, uh, barely, what, three, 400 miles away. Um, 
But I'm, I mean, I'm really excited by uh, Coastal Salish and Haida traditions. Do, do, you, do you know about the Salmon Festival? Um, so those of you who don't know about the Salmon, you should know about the Salmon Festival. It's fucking brilliant. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's enough to, to stop me being vegetarian. So the idea of the Salmon Festival is that um, so you, the, the first salmon is caught, and for 10 days you celebrate uh, the, the capture of the salmon uh, and you celebrate not just the, the fact that you know, the, the salmon have come back, uh, but you recognize in that celebration over the 10 days uh, through your meditation and engagement with the salmon and the celebration of it, the treaty that your people have made with the salmon people. The treaty that your people make with the salmon people. It, it seems to me that in that moment, uh, there's a profound shift in the way that one thinks about nature. Rather than instrumentalizing it, rather than nature being the sort of thing that you drive to a state park to see, uh, all of a sudden you recognize that you and the salmon people are both parts of these, you know, the, the, this, this way of life making. Uh, and that, yes, you are about to eat this thing, uh, but it comes with responsibilities, and it comes with obligations, and it comes with a recognition of your place and your place not as uh, superior um, to, to, to the thing that you're about to eat, but actually as part uh, within the web of life uh, as a peer, something that, that you get to make a treaty with. You don't get to make treaties with things that aren't your equal. Uh, and yet to be able to make a treaty with the salmon people is to cast us in a radically different way of being. Um, and that's important because you, you don't get to make you to undo cheap nature just by your going and contemplating a field of daffodils or, you know, or, or just hugging your favorite tree. It's, it's not an individual issue. And I think that's one of the, the things that capitalism in, incites us to do, is to say, well, you know, if only I wear Birkenstocks, everything's going to be fine. Um, and that, this, this, is, this is much more uh, about, uh, I mean, not, not that I would accuse anyone in Seattle of, of thinking that. Uh, but, but, um, <laughs> But, but you, uh, I mean, you, you certainly get the idea, right? That, that, that this is a, 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 the kind of, uh, of transformation that needs to happen not as an individual lifestyle choice, uh, but as a, a, a much more sort of significant societal shift. Um, and of course, you know, you are seeing these sort of transformations in the world of work as well. I mean, you know, the, 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 the uh, notwithstanding the success right now that uh, industry is having in rolling back uh, labor regulations. Um, the idea of uh, you know, that, that union movements and workers' centers are flourishing, uh, that there are ways that workers are finding to, you know, to, to survive uh, you know, in the United States uh, an onslaught on their rights that, that, you know, that, that, that has been almost total. Um, today I was very pleased uh, to hear that uh, the coalition of Immokalee workers won the MacArthur, well, one of the recipients of the MacArthur Genius Prize. Do you know about the coalition of Immokalee workers? Oh, the, the, those of you, again, who, you haven't. Um, so a, a lot of the counter-seasonal tomatoes that are grown in the United States, so the winter tomatoes come from uh, Immokalee in southern Florida. Um, those workers are as far away as it's possible to be from union re regulations. Um, and yet, so, so, so they need to come out, come out with some way of protecting their rights as workers and as human beings. Uh, since uh, the law is so woefully inadequate in southern states, as I'm discovering, I, I, you know, I, I didn't really get the CIW and why they they adopted practices like protesting outside Wendy's or uh, McDonald's or, or Walmart. I was like, well, why don't you just go to the NLRB? Why don't you go to the National Labor Relations Board and make your case? Now that I live in Texas, uh, I understand a little better what it is to be organizing in the southern state uh, and how little the state and how little the government is prepared to help you, in, you know, in, particularly when everything's leaning right. Um, so what they've done in, uh, in the CIW, in the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, is precisely set up and, uh, ways of tarnishing a brand uh, with uh, its you know, egregious labor violations uh, and bring a, a brand to talk to its supply chain, which then talks to the, the tomato farmers, which then makes the farmers sign contracts uh, that recognize labor rights. Um, and so in, in a sense, this is a way of legislating when the state can't. Uh, and won't. Uh, and uh, the idea then is that you start developing worker centers and charters for fair food uh, that are radically different from the model where you, you petition government because increasingly government doesn't represent workers. It doesn't represent the working class at all. And so you have to develop new, uh, new and creative ways of surviving uh, in, in a time when the government doesn't belong to you. Um, so there are these victories. Uh, and it, the, this victory has been won with tomatoes and recently in, in a battle with Ben and Jerry's in Vermont with milk. 
Um, so you are seeing in certain kinds of commodities, certain kinds of spaces of work, new ways of organizing and new ways of making work expensive uh, and new ways of, uh, you know, of, of trying to sort of re reclaim dignity. This is not the revolution, but it's you know, the, the sort of thing that, again, a five, $15 an hour wage moves us towards. Uh, it moves us towards certain kinds of, uh, of recognition of the value of work uh, and the value of care. Um, again, you know, when you have care workers unionizing in cooperatives backed uh, improbably by the SEIU um, in, uh, in, in, in New York, you, you have moments where care work increasingly is becoming recognized and rewarded and redistributed. Um, and the idea of cheap money, I mean, uh, frankly, I think this, this is the hardest one to, to wrap your head around, uh, but there are uh, movements that are keen to, to not just make money cheap, but to recognize that its cheapness is premised on this kind of exploitation. Uh, and movements for reparations are alive and well. I mean, I, I was very pleased to see Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, write about the, the case for reparations for slavery in the United States. Uh, and outside the United States, reparations for everything from colonialism to, to climate debt are alive and well too. Um, and the reparations for climate debt are something we're gonna have to reckon with here. Um, we, you know, this, this way of living is only made possible by the, the savage destruction of the planet. Um, if we take a relationship to that, uh, then we need to think about reparations and what that looks like. Um, but you know what? That's, I mean, it, it, it doesn't suck. Uh, to, to be able to take, look, again, I mean, this is, uh, I, I as, uh, as someone constructed as a man in capitalist society, I grew up with patriarchy. And I have to do everything I can for the rest of my life to try and flay it out of me and flay the sexism out of me. Um, now, that's just a thing, right? We now recognize that sexism is bad and that anyone who isn't doing everything they can to, to, to get rid of it in themselves is part of the problem. That's, you know, and, and that's, that's what, you know, this is me taking a relationship to uh, a structure of power that I didn't ask for but nonetheless have profited from and it's not okay for it to continue and so this is work that I have to do with my, my brothers and sisters and comrades uh, in order to be able to trans transform the world so my, my children to grow up in that world, right? That's, that, we agree that, you know, raise your hands if you want to be more sexist uh, or if patriarchy is okay. Okay, good. So, you know, we're, we're, so we're okay with people, we're okay with, uh, with men taking a, a relationship to being produced by patriarchy and recognizing that that's not okay and they have to, uh, they have to overcome that. Um, and we, you know, men don't get prizes for recognizing that they're patriarchs. They shouldn't get prizes for recognizing they're patriarchs. Uh, you know, we, we should do this because it's the right damn thing to do and it's not okay to carry on the way that we are. Uh, yeah, but in the same way, all right, everyone's happy for me to, to recognize my patriarchy. Is it okay also then for me to ask for white people to recognize white supremacy? Is it okay then for us to recognize you know, uh, class prejudice? Uh, is it okay for, you know, for, for us to recognize um, the, the, you know, the, the histories of, of uh, exploitation that allow us to, to be on what was once Muckleshoot land? Sure, it's the same thing. Uh, and it's, you, know, you don't get prizes for it, but we accept that even if, in fact, I'm gonna be worse off by giving out my patriarchal pr uh, power um, and dividend, that's better for everyone, including me. And so, you know, uh, selling this kind of model of transformation uh, and of the idea of reparations isn't about what you lose, it's about what you gain even though you will be poorer. Uh, because what you gain is something that everyone agrees uh, is, you know, the, the trajectory we're on right now is shameful. Uh, and it's okay for us to be moving to a different one. And again, what it takes is, is imagination. I mean, uh, I, the, the goal of this book, the goal of this kind of work is to pierce our imaginations so that we can imagine a world after capitalism. Um, and we have so many good models right here in this country. I mean, you know, uh, maybe if, if we end with, with cheap food, I mean, you know, uh, just already so many of us engage in the kinds of work that are good and noble, like you know, giving, giving away food at the church food bank. But what we need to do is imagine something more systemic. And you know, the, the group that I like for, for this uh, is uh, a group that was radical in, in addressing just a number of crises among the working class and among uh, people of color um, in, in Oakland. Uh, and what they did was also give away free food and you know, attend to care and healthcare in particular and the care of elders and education. Um, and of course, you know, the, 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 this group uh, was dramatically important because they helped not only uh, feed the poor, uh, but its participants um, you know, uh, 
famously chauvinist participants uh, were also reported by their, their female colleagues to be become less chauvinist through their participation in this kind of thing. Um, and of course, that's the Black Panthers, right? The, the Black Panthers is an organization that understood that there is um, a dignified emergency among the poor in this country right now. Uh, and you need to recognize and attend to that. But you have to help people survive pending revolution. The, 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 this is a, a Black Panther School Meal Program that's about survival pending revolution. And it's okay to, to, to think, think revolutionary thoughts because we have no choice. The, uh, the, the case we're, we're making is that the, the underpinnings of modern capitalism are in crisis. Um, we're shifting to something already. I mean, you know, whether it's a certain kind of state authoritarianism uh, or you know, whether it's sort of flat fascism or whether it's something different. Um, and you know, I mean, I, I, I know a thing or two about you know the, the, this this moment of, of climate crisis, um, you know, uh, and the authoritarianism that can happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm connected to a country where you know, a, a man who's you know the, the, the head of state has nothing but contempt for the uh, for the poor, who, who wages war through uh, you know sort of civil war through Islamophobia, um, and who, who, who thinks that that uh, you know that, that Islamic terrorism is is among us and ready to tear us apart. Um, who gives not a fig about climate change, fire, you know, just, just you know, uh, is, is very much in favor of coal um, and has basically instituted a fascist regime. And, of course, that man is Narendra Modi, right? Narendra Modi in India is basically a textbook fascist. Uh, and his, his war on uh, you know, his, his sort of Islamophobic rhetoric and actions and his disdain for climate change, and his support of large businesses at the expense of, of working people, and his war on indigenous people, and his, you know, so, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, looks very much like uh, the, the, the America that we live in now. Um, and fascist is the, the term that we use in the academy to describe what he's doing. Um, we have alternatives, though, uh, and we ought to be ready to, to, to be, first of all, to, to call capitalism what it is, uh, but also to imagine ourselves as revolutionaries. Uh, because without that, uh, I think that the, the, you know, the, the capitalist scene is going to end badly for us. But it doesn't have to. Uh, and what these movements show is that um, we can thrive and flourish in a world that does have deep justice in it, uh, as opposed to the rather superficial kind that we're heading uh, towards right now. Maybe that's where I'll stop for, for, for right now. And thank you very much. Hello. Hi. Thank you for your presentation and I think an important contribution to um, undermining the concept of the Anthropocene. I'd like to um, offer two observations with a question. Um, the film Menstrual Man, the main character, it's a documentary, a South Indian man, mm. um, says he refuses venture cap capitalism because he wants to be like the bee that takes pollen from the flower. He gets what he needs without harming anything. Mm. And it's, I think, a wonderful metaphor for rupturing the economic oppression of aspects of capitalism. But my main point is this, um, and this is my research. And we don't have a ton of time, so if you could okay, come no, to no, a question, okay, that would be okay. great. Yeah. Um, according to the Global Slavery Index, mm. there are 45.8 million people enslaved in the world. Everyone in this room who has a phone probably has coltane in it from Eastern Congo. So I think there's a missed opportunity, although it's important when you do the lives, mm. the chicken people, because unless we look at the deep oppression and injustice of the fact that much of how we live here now is embedded in the blood on, uh, from enslaved people, many in Congo. That's right, yeah. So I'm wondering what you think about that, that you've kind of chosen, in my mind, um, a light, L-I-T image for the lives, one that we can say to ourselves, well, it's just chicken, I don't eat chicken, mm. I'm a vegetarian, as opposed to the fact that we are doing sustainability light unless yeah. we look at the millions enslaved. I th thank you so much for that question. I mean, uh, the, the um, I, I I was, I was wondering whether to, 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 to give a different talk. So uh, here we are, this is some, some feedback. Um, uh, but, so the, the and, and in particular, what, what I wanted to do was talk about Columbus. Um, because, you know, we, we've just had Columbus Day, though magnificently it's Indigenous Peoples Day here. Um, but uh, the, other, the other thing you could call it is Capitalism Day. Uh, and, and the reason to do that is 
uh, to recognize that, that the slaughter of indigenous people is just part of what capitalism uh, it does, right? The, the, uh, and in particular here, um, the, the, reason, the reason I'm sort of interested in Columbus for this, for, for this book uh, is because he's alive and well. Look at what he does. Um, he, he persuades a range of financiers um, that despite the fact that he's got a fairly spotty track record, he hasn't you know, consistently turned a profit, he's going to make it possible for people to open up new vistas of exploitation and of, uh, of mineral wealth. Um, and he goes over, I mean, he treats his workers very badly. He offers a huge amount of money to the first person who sees land on, from the, on the Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria. Uh, some poor bastard sees land, and Columbus said, no, no, you didn't see, I, I, saw, I saw that already. I, was, I, didn't, I, you know, I just forgot to write it down or blow the whistle. Uh, but no, the, the money comes to me. And so you know, he, he steals money from, from his workers. Uh, he treats them obviously very badly. Um, and then he brings home slaves. Um, you know, he inaugurates the transatlantic slave trade, though perhaps not in the direction we're used to it. Uh, he brings slaves, and, he, and he's, he says, in the name of the Holy Trinity, uh, let us bring home all the slaves that can be brought. Uh, he writes that in a letter to, um, to his uh, royal benefactors in Spain. Um, but the idea of a, a man selling financiers on promises, despite you know, not, not huge amounts of profit, uh, and who it simultaneously pays workers but pays them badly, uses slaves, uh, and creates this huge ecosystem uh, in which he's you know, able to, to exploit things. Well, the, you know, the man who does that uh, more locally is Jeff Bezos, right? Uh, yes. J Jeff Bezos, uh, sorry, not Bezos, Bezos, um, uh, is uh, you know, a, a guy who, on the strength of very little profit, has managed to persuade financiers to part with huge amounts of money. And then, and look what he's, he's planning to do, you know, the, the, the idea of jetting off to the moon. Um, is, I mean, he's in fact explicitly said that the reason he's excited about uh, colonizing the moon is to bring entrepreneurship and capitalism there. Uh, and those are his languages. In fact, he used that language in an interview with uh, like a junior space cadet magazine for NASA or something, which uh, you, know, you, you, you would think that, well, I mean, I, I suppose it's appropriate that, that you know, the kids need to know about the improving virtues of capitalism, uh, and Jeff's the man to tell them. Um, but the idea that actually, at the same time as these grand visions of space travel, they coexist with the kinds of slavery and the coltan mining that you depend on so that when you ask Alexa to play you something in the shower and buy you soap, uh, that, that you re re rely on that slavery that, that's in Alexa as you speak to her. Um, that, I think, is, is entirely compatible, and you know, that's something that you see from Columbus to the present day. So while Columbus is thankfully dead and buried, um, the kinds of things that, that he inaugurated are alive and well, and in fact, are alive and well in this town. So I, th I thank you for that feedback, that's very helpful. One question over here. Hello, thanks, thanks for the talk, really enjoyed it. Um, so my question is, uh, you've kind of given us two directions, I think, of, of the way the world could go. You, you've, you've illustrated things are looking really badly with the economic and the environmental trends, mm. but you've also said there are some trends going in the other direction as well, and you've mm. pointed out some approaches we could take uh, to, to reverse those trends. And my question for you is, are you optimistic that these are actually going to happen? Uh, the, tr the trends that you've mentioned, like social justice, like getting together, do you, are you optimistic that the arc of history tends, trends towards justice? Or are you pessimistic, which I feel myself more pessimistic, even though I agree with, I think we share a lot of similar attitudes, but I'm pessimistic about these things actually making the transition. You show the slides of the clan where one group of people subjugates another group of people, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious about your optimism that these changes will occur versus pessimism, where, it's where, where, where I find myself more leaning yeah, towards. I mean, I, 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 what, what can I say? I feel you. I mean, I, I, I'm, yeah, if, if anyone in this room doesn't have both pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will, this is probably not the room for you. I mean, I, I think, you know, that, that you need a clear-eyed observation of where it is that we're heading. Um, but to, uh, I, I think that this, you know, the, the, the standard thing to say is, look, well, we have a choice and we, you know, we are, uh, we, you know, if only we turn things around right now. It, you know, it, it is like the, the graph of bad things. It's, it's a kind of trope in talks like this where it's like, well, on the one hand, we have doom and destruction. On the other hand, we have hope and liberty and, just, and joy and whatever it is. That, well, but the fact is that um, you, you need the, the same faculties that, that recognize the trends that, uh, that are about exploitation. Uh, are, you know, th that's a, a clear-sighted view of what's going on in the world today. And it's no less a clear-sighted view to point out that there are huge movements of millions of people whose voices never appear uh, in the mainstream media uh, that are fighting back. 
and you do it what one does a disservice to 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 uh, to split it up into sort of pessimism and optimism um in in a way that, because you, all you're doing is coming with clear analysis and the clear analysis shows these moments of crises and that people are moving forward and organizing um and so one, one doesn't need to uh, in a sense one doesn't need to take a position um you don't have to be pessimistic or optimistic i mean that 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 you know that sort of social psychology is important for movement building but for the, for the purposes of seeing the way the world is one has to do justice to the horror and to the beauty of it um and it's not this isn't about sort of well you know but yeah, everything's going badly but but we you know th 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 there's there's at least some indigenous people are doing great things uh it's much more about look th this is this is the way that people are fighting and we have to we never see that fight uh and we to to some extent we never see the destruction in its in its awesome and and horrific sort of entirety um we need to we need to look at both and mm -hmm. when you look at both it's not even that one has a choice about being optimistic or pessimistic it's just look it's either this or you 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 either fight or you don't look you don't get to look at yourself in the morning and feel good mm. um and so i i think again just to honor the kinds of movements that are happening around the world um and to to recognize them is the kind of rocket fuel one needs um the optimism the pessimism let's let's worry about that a little less um and let's think about where the energy for us to be able to fight it is going to come from and that comes from seeing these amazing movements uh, and and that that's got to make you feel better and if that results in a little bit more optimism so much the better okay yeah? thank you the initiating a rebellion against capitalism is very important and i think it's mostly folks under the ages of 20 25 they become rampant capitalists they become rampant consumers especially in this country how would you approach someone of high school age or grade school age and try to put capitalism in a perspective for them because as i said all that we were asked to do during the years of george w bush was consume we were they were glorifying capitalism how on earth do we go about changing the mindset of people under the age of 18 in this country and making them aware that capitalism is killing this country well i mean you know, uh, uh, I I I was thrilled that uh, and th thank you for the question but, but you know but my my kids elementary school um is much more uh, aware of the, the the destruction of the climate uh, co you know sorry, the, the 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 destruction of the planet caused by climate change and fossil fuels than the EPA is um <laughs> which isn't saying much I mean but but still you know uh, I mean the, the there there are I mean there there there, there is data suggesting that um particularly sort of pre-teens a a fairly well you know attuned to to ideas of climate change and uh, and a few of them are incredible leaders in 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 the climate justice movement um but in general uh, i mean you know I, i think that there's there's you know also just to put this into his, historical context everyone feels like the kids man what what are we going to do about the kids they're just idiots uh, <laughs> and th th there's also a very real sense in which um with the rise of social media uh the, the you know the, the, there's the, there's a fairly profound shift in the way that people are approaching and relating to to one another and to the planet um the, the rates of depression among young people for example as a result of social media exposure are much much higher and that that worries me a great deal uh, and in general you know and the, again this is sort of the bumper sticker observation about social media and uh, that kind of that, that kind of shift that's happening among young people that when the product is free the product is you right well when you're using social media when the product is free the product is you uh, and the, the the fact that that young people have been turned in, are being incited into being turned to these engines of consumption i think is uh, a, a worry but i also think that when you look at who it is that's voting uh, and trending left uh, in the united states uh, one of the best things that that you can do for young people um is to put them through the college system and then leave them with a lifetime of debt uh and uh <laughs> No, I mean I mean obviously I I'm I'm being utterly facetious there but but you know the the, the fact is that an, an an exposure to capitalism that that is naked and raw that 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 emerges through for example uh the, the education system here and the crushing debt that results and the very clear uh, and clear sighted uh, analysis that you know that, that makes young people recognize that you'll never be able to afford your own home not at least not not where you want to uh and that you know the, the job options that are open to you are, are going to be fairly limited uh, all of a sudden that you know that se seismic shift that happens through college in the early 20s is one of the reasons why you have young bernie supporters uh but it's also one of the reasons why you're also seeing the the rise of white supremacy right i mean you you're you're seeing 
uh, stories about, you know, well, the reason that the, these jobs are not available is because uh, brown people are coming in and taking them away, or the, the role of men is being usurped by women, or whatever it is. Uh, the, you know, the, the, these transformations are also coming with their own, their own political doctrines. Uh, I, I think you know, the antidote to all of this is organizing. Uh, I also think, obviously, uh, banning advertising of things to children is a good idea. Um, but that, you know, and, and I'm so excited that Brazil is doing this, right? You know, do you hear about this? That, that um, in order to protect, yeah. You know, so the, the reason advertising, as economists will know, is information. You know, the reason we have advertising is to help people figure out which brands they want. Um, and uh, so, the, the, you know, in, in, in economic theory, that, that's the reason to advertise, is to, you know, to share information about products so that rational consumers can, can make their rational decisions. The trouble is, of course, that children are not rational. Um, and, you know, we don't let them do things like, we don't let them vote. We, you know, we, we, I mean, even in Texas, we don't let them have guns. Uh, and uh, so the, the, there are some things we don't expose children to because they're not rational. Uh, and what Brazil, uh, they, a, a Brazilian human rights or children's humans, human rights uh, quasi-governmental body did was propose that uh, everything that was being marketed to children not be marketed to children. So children shouldn't be exposed to marketing. Uh, and I think that, that that sort of move is a, is a nice, you know, it's not a, it's not, it's not a revolution, but it's helpful in trying to protect children from precisely the kinds of uh, dangers that, that, that you see, sir. Uh, so I think that, that that's certainly part of it. Um, well, first of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, there's so many points that I want to discuss, but uh, there's, there's one that I'm particularly struggling with. Mm. And uh, uh, actually, I got really inspired about 10 years ago in terms of the food movement and uh, decided to start my own company to really make an impact. Mm. Um, today, we've actually grown quite large. In Seattle alone, uh, we serve close to 30,000 meals a week just in organic food. Um, and I'm convinced uh, now that I've very much gone in the wrong direction. Um, and here's why, and I think this is the point that I'm really struggling with, um, what you're talking about. Mm is uh, we do a lot of the right things. Uh, we pay our people a lot of money, we have all sorts of benefits, uh, we let them uh, have uh, free meals uh, throughout uh, the day and they can bring uh, food uh, home. We donate about a million dollars a year um, of food to food banks. Um, the people that we serve, um, which I consider like wealthy, liberal Seattleites, are continually demanding cheaper food. Um, no, re like nobody really actually is willing to pay the true price of food. And if you really go see it and like, you really go see in the stores what it's like to like try to be a farmer, like really try to be a farmer, the farmers we work with, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I think we put a lot of pressure in terms of uh, what's going on in terms of these companies like Nestle or you know, Monsanto or whomever. Um, but how do we really make a shift when everybody's really asking for the cheap food? If I opened up right next to KFC um, in the Midwest, I don't think I would do very well. Um, and like, how do, how do we actually get, I'm convinced that I did the wrong thing. I started a company really, what I should have done is gone and tried to get people to buy good food. Mm -hmm. And that is a massive struggle that I'm seeing today. Um, I don't, I don't know, I, I feel like I'm probably mostly responsible for my cheap buying food habits. We're all mostly responsible for those things, rather than the Nestle's of the world who are just trying to feed, you know, the demand that, that we're pushing. I, well, first of all, thank you for your work. Uh, what's, what's the name of your company? Uh, the company is called Molly's. Molly's. I, I, I don't know, but, but, I, but it sounds like you're doing the right... Uh, but, but, so he, here's the thing, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, I would encourage all of us to, to, to recognize what it is that impels us towards buying cheap food. Um, why do we buy cheap food? Because we don't have time and we don't have money. Uh, and if you're running from one place to another, um, I mean, to, uh, food needs to be convenient, right? Uh, we, we, we buy our food in, in order for it to, 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 to fit a certain kind of lifestyle. Um, but that lifestyle is not one that we've all chosen. Uh, and when you're on you know, $9 an hour uh, and you're working every hour God sends to be able to make it, you know, to be able to just uh, survive and to be able to pay the medical bills and to be able to pick your kids up um, and uh, make sure you know, that you have a, a, you know, an hour a day of family time uh, and you're, you can't afford to live near where the work is because the rent's too high, so you have to, you know, you have to commute uh, uh, huge distances. Then all of a sudden, um, it, it, it feels like you're blaming, you know, I'm not saying you're, you're, you're but it, 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 when one says, well, you know, the, the working class, you know, they're just having, um, you know, they're, they're eating the food off their laps because they love it. Um, that, that seems to me blaming the victim, right? I mean, if, if you're, 
uh, if you're not able to, to be able to uh, find the time and find the access to, to good, healthy food uh, in a way that is affordable, um, blaming the food for being too expensive seems to me to be uh, wrong. I mean, it, it seems to me that, that the problem is that people aren't being paid enough. Um, and one of the, the organizations that I love that, that's really confronted this is, uh, weirdly, is Slow Food. Right? You know, uh, people know slow food as a sort of circle jerk of olive oil fanciers and red wine fetishes. <laughs> um, but but in its, you know, at, its, at its inception, slow food was an, you know, was an organization of anarchists and communists who, who understood that uh, the reason people in Italy were, were increasingly being drawn to, to cheap food um, is because they didn't have time or money. And so what do they do? They unionize uh, agricultural workers and they fight for two hours of lunch break a day so people can you know, spend one hour going to the post office and doing what you need to do, and then, at least, and then another hour actually enjoying stuff. Um, and it is both a material and a cultural shift. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I think without those material and cultural shifts, obviously people get to, you know, will buy cheap food. But when, I mean, I, this is one of the nice things about being in the food movement, is that we recruit, um, and we get to recruit three times a day uh, if, if we're doing it right. Uh, and th that, that idea of uh, using meals to be able to, to recruit for social change, um, it, it seems to me it is, is something that I, I, I've seen happen. Uh, I, I've seen people be able to sort of embrace that you know, when, you, when you taste your first tomato, I mean a proper one, um, rather than the, you know, the, the, the sort of the green ammunition that the sort of bounces off, um, you know, that you, you can use as a bouncing ball. Um, but when you actually taste something that is amazing, when you get affected by the health consequences of eating badly, uh, all of a sudden you, you, you get to t have a, a slightly different relationship to food. Uh, but that's an individual uh, experience. Uh, but collectivizing it and recognizing that everyone deserves the right to pleasure um, is a political movement. And so I, I see that, and, and so Slow Food it certainly embraces the idea that entrepreneurship is vital. Uh, but it's, it can't happen through entrepreneurship alone. And so I, I would encourage you to reach out to allies in the union movement um, and uh, in the good food movement to be able to find ways of inculcating not, not just the joy for food, um, but also the capacity to be able to, to, to appreciate it and pay what it's worth. Because you know, we, we do need to respect farmers' labor, as you, as you say. Mm. Um, and it, I, I think you're in the right, the right, the right business. It just we, we need more of it. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. thank you. I think this, is there a question over there as oh, well? Yes. All right, we're, I think we have time for these last two questions. All right. Hello. Hey, thank you very much. I, re I really enjoyed that. And you really seem to uh, vilify capitalism. And just kind of touching on the last gentleman's point, mm. isn't it really human greed that's the problem? That we, we love money or we love things more than people and we. We use people to make money rather than use our money for people. So it's, we vote with our dollars. So we are all either making good choices or bad choices with every dollar we spend. And sure, the people that are you know, making minimum wage are going to have less money to spend on food. But we all have a thousand times more than we need. And we still make those same cheap choices and, and you know, we are making food cheap. So mm. would you agree that it's really greed that's the problem and not capitalism? It's the, it's the human heart that needs to be changed, not the, not the social system. I, I, th th thank you for that question. I mean, b by the way, I, I, I think entrepreneurship is terrific. Um, I, I just, I, 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 but I, I do think that the problem is capitalism. Here's why. Um, humans have always been greedy, right? I mean, we are, you know, wired to be greedy, but luckily we're not just wired to be greedy. We're also, it's also possible, and in, in fact, it, 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 humans are also social animals. We're also, our brains are, are wired uh, to encourage, you know, encourage altruism and generosity. Um, one of the ways we can, I, I could demonstrate this to you is, for example, we, we could play a, a, what's called a reciprocity game, uh, where uh, so someone gives you a dollar, and you get to split that dollar in whatever proportion makes sense to you. Uh, and you give half to me, or you know, whatever proportion to me, and you keep a, a proportion, and then I get to decide whether this is fair enough for us both to, to, to keep what you've decided and move on, or I can reject it and no one gets anything. So, for example, if someone gives you a dollar, how much are you gonna give to me? 90 cents. 90? <laughs> because you are free of greed, except 10 cents worth. 
Right. Okay. Um, okay. So, 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 you know, so, so okay. Now, you know, across a range of societies and across a range of, of um, you know, of, 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 of humans in in uh, in North America, for example, this game has been played, uh, and it's striking that uh, the most greedy individuals are graduate students in economics. Uh, so graduate economic students are the ones who, who t do the rational thing. The rational thing is you keep 99, I get one cent, and I still get one more cent than I would have gotten otherwise. And that's, you know, and that's an optimal outcome for me and for you, because I get a cent. Uh, and th that's, that should be what it is that, that greed demands, right? Greed would demand 99 for you, one for me, and that's the rational choice. But no one does it. Not even the graduate students in economics. They do like 32 cents for me and the rest for you. Uh, as, as graduate economics, even they have some some you know, sort of modicum of, of decency left. Um, and and what's interesting about that is that there are societies that go much more your way, where it's like, well, I'm, I'm going to give it all except except one cent that I have to keep, but because I know that the next time we play this game, you're going to owe me, right? And so that there are societies where this split is is sometimes flipped over. Um, and the, the, what this demonstrates, first of all, is that the extent to which we allow our greed to, to be the defining factor of who we are is socially conditioned. Uh, greed has always happened in human society, but so has altruism and generosity and a range of other things. The trouble is that c when you pair that greed to a social system that is able to discard certain kinds of people and certain kinds of nature and take a certain relationship to the things that we allow to be profitable or, or unprofitable, then we're in trouble. So we can imagine societies where people take entre you know, entrepreneurial decisions. We can imagine societies where people are you know, greedy for themselves, but not so greedy that they will trump everything that's wrong, you know, everything else with society. But that's not this society. This society is, is one in which uh, you know, the natural greed to which our species is heir is magnified out of all proportion to any other restraining factor uh, and, and is given full reign of the planet uh, and other species and the ecosystems on which we depend. Uh, and so the problem isn't greed, really. But if you remove the greed, remove the greedy people from a capitalistic society, it wouldn't be a bad thing. It would be a great society. But you can't remove the greed from ourselves. We're all greedy. No, but, you're, but, you're but, wrong. You can't. That's how people change. Well, well actually, I, I think one of the ways of changing people is, for example, I mean, that's what the graduate student in economics story is, is that you can teach people to be more greedy or less greedy, right? Uh, and so I think we can agree on that, and we can also agree that there are certain civilizations that do this much better than we do, uh, and perhaps moving, learning many more of their lessons rather than uh, you know, just booting the greedy out, but recognizing that actually we're, we're, this is all part of us as well. I think that realizing that these reciprocal social relations uh, might be a way forward. We can talk about this later on. <laughs> and so. one last question. Okay, thank you. Um, so you started your talk uh, calling out the animal agriculture uh, industry mm. Um, and introduce the horrible fact that you know 50 billion chickens are uh, born and die every year um, in this industry. Uh, but then you went to uh, went on to praise later the salmon festival, where you described a pact being made between humans and the salmon people. Mm. Um, and it seems to me that there's no more um, of a domineering and oppressive mindset than. Um, that we can uh, enter into some kind of mutual agreement with someone that allows us to eat them. Um, and so I'm, my question is, why did you uh, leave out the animal rights movement from your final slide, especially where uh, mm. you were talking about social movements that are already fighting um, these kind of oppressive mindsets? And why haven't you called out the attitude that we can um, use other conscious creatures uh, for food as one of the attitudes that needs to change in a post-capitalist um, society? I, uh, th th thank you for that. I mean, I, I think that... that in fact, to uh, the, the, the instr inter instrumentalization of uh, animals for, uh, for human food in, uh, under capitalism is abhorrent. Um, but I, 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 in a sense, I, I put that, that Haida and um, Coastal Salish uh, tradition up there also as a challenge, right? Uh, because there are um, a range of human civilizations that, as I say, haven't destroyed the planet. Um, that, are, that, that have sustainable relationships with other species um, in which they understand their relationship to those species as not one of dominion uh, or of ownership, uh, but of recognition that you know, this, this, is, this is the way that, that we as one animal survive on another um, in, you know, in, in a chain of life. Uh, and 
I, I, I certainly am not comfortable uh, telling coastal Salish people that what they need to be is vegan. Uh, but I, I'm, I am comfortable saying that, uh, in fact, under, uh, uh, under capitalism, there are ways of, uh, I mean, e even under veganism, um, we need to, to address some of these other factors. I, I think that, that that's, that's one of my, I was, I was just at the Compassion in World Farming Conference last week, uh, where uh, the, the, the challenge for me is recognizing that uh, the lifestyle, lifestyle shift towards, for, for example, the consumption of soy uh, is also compatible with the exploitation of workers and uh, the destruction of the environment. Um, you know, the soy production and the destruction of the Brazilian Cerrado is, uh, is a nightmare. Um, and when we move, uh, if we're moving towards a more systemic shift away, uh, the consumption of vegan food has to be part of a, 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 this bigger shift in understanding how it is that we and the planet go together. Uh, and when we're thinking about where fertilizer comes from uh, and of where, where, uh, you know, where animals fit into that kind of agricultural system, um, I've, I, I, there are a few agricultural systems that I know of that are internally you know, agroecologically consistent that don't in some way rely on animals. Um, so that, that's the challenge, it seems to me, um, for uh, a sustainable uh, future for us, is to explore and develop ways that, that, that recognize our relationship to animals uh, and that aren't about you know, the, the, the kind of massive cruelty that we, we see there. Well, that might be good for us, but it doesn't sound very good for the animals. No, I mean, I mean I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think that the, the challenge is to figure out on the, renegotiating those terms. Thank you so much, Rash Patel. Thank you all so much for being here.